Colossians uh, chapter 2. One of the things uh, we, we, uh, I always have is not enough time. And uh, <clears throat> I have too much message for the time slots and for the ADD of America, Americans. And uh, I have uh, too many messages for the time for the, for the services we have. And, and uh, so, um, but uh, today we got up there pretty early, so I'd have time to preach a whole message and not cut things out. But I ran over during Bible class at 10 o'clock. And so, uh, but uh, this message is something I'm, I, I want to, I want to teach on spiritual gifts. And I've been, we've been stewing on that and the Lord's been stirring me on that, but I, I'm trying to find a time to preach it. And this is kind of an intro a little bit to it. And we're going to go into spiritual gifts. It won't be this 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 week. Uh, maybe next Sunday. We'll, we'll see how the Lord leads and when he has for us. I want to get rid of confusion on spiritual gifts and teach on uh, what God is doing today and uh, and things. But uh, I want to start off with Colossians. I said chapter 2, but it's actually the end of chapter 1. But it's going to lead us into it. And uh, Colossians <clears throat> in chapter 1. We're going to read verses 24 through 29. I want to talk about don't doubt his mighty work in you. Don't doubt his mighty work in you. <clears throat> it says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. Let's ask the Lord to help us. I'm going to pray. Why don't you pray and ask God to speak to you and others around you while we, while we have service. Father, I pray you'd help now. Oh, Lord, what a great responsibility to preach the word of God. What an honor. Uh, what a thing I'm not worthy of, but thank you for your word. I thank you for your people who are here and who've taken time to come to church, who took time to come here. And uh, Lord, I thank you for whatever the story or how you drew them from around the world, uh, from different circumstances. And Lord, they come hungry. <clears throat> they come wanting to learn. And uh, Father, all of us are in battle against a uh, ungodly world and against Satan. And, and we need wisdom. We need encouragement. We need uh, truth from your word. And I pray today that uh, the devil's lies would be undone. And I pray your light of your word would shine forth. And I ask your Holy Spirit to be the teacher and to empower me. Give me everything from the expressions to the words to the thoughts and everything that's done. And even things that aren't said or, or shown, I pray that your Spirit would speak personally personally to each one of us. We ask for your help now. We ask for your power. We ask for your blessing upon the service. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, the interesting thing, verse 24, uh, just starting off here, is Paul talks about he wants to catch up on something. Uh, he's a little behind. How many of you are behind on something right now in your life? How many are behind? Uh, let me re-ask that. How many of you are not behind on something in your life right now? Uh, one of you. Okay. And uh, we need him to teach us all how to say God up. And uh, and uh, I am behind on all kinds of things. And uh, if you have spare time and just looking for something to do, let me know. And uh, But... Uh, I'm uh, I'm getting better. I'm much better at uh, working on things ahead of time now. I've learned. I've get, I've gotten better at planning, and and my memory has, has repaired itself. So I had some memory problems, and it's gotten better. And but I'm still behind. And Paul was behind on something. He wanted to catch up. Verse twenty four. But now who would I rejoice in my sufferings for you? Paul's rejoicing in his suffering to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for His body's sake, which is the church. You just caught what he said. Paul said, you know, I am rejoicing because I'm starting to catch up a little bit. I'm starting to suffer a lot more because I started out way behind you guys. I was the one causing the afflictions, and I don't feel like I've suffered enough for Christ. So right now I'm catching up on my afflictions. I've been beaten. I'm in jail. 
Uh, they are harassing me everywhere I go. And you know what? Isn't it great? I'm rejoicing in this. I'm getting to catch up on the sufferings that I didn't suffer before for God. I spent most of my life being a wealthy uh, Jewish Pharisee, and now I've lost everything. And now I get beaten, and now I get thrown into jail, and now I've lost everything, and I'm rejoicing that I get to catch up on those sufferings. Uh, Paul was behind on something. He's behind on the sufferings. He had not suffered enough. If Paul was behind on his sufferings, you're probably behind also. You know, that's why when you read things like that, that's why you just, you, after a while, when you hear the American Christianity of, of God has not blessed me enough and you only go to church Sunday night, like I just said, uh, climb Mount Everest, and when you're done, go ahead and swim the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that's what they, they act like you just said. And 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 they're going, no. And you say, you need to, you, you know what? That music is not godly. You might need to give that up. <gasps> that's my music. I like it. And they act like a sacrifice for God is like a foreign concept. Like, that's not in the Bible. Where did you get that from? And 1 Peter 4, 1, for as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he that has suffered the flesh has ceased from sin. It is given unto you on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians 1.29, I believe it is. Look, suffering for God is part of the Christian life. You just happen to be really blessed to live in a nation where you can freely serve God and have a whole bunch of comforts and nobody's going to come take your house or burn your house down or, 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 or slaughter your children or, kill you or put you in jail because you're a Christian. That does not mean you, you should say, okay, I'll never have to suffer. You just have to suffer personal sacrifice by choice. That means you, you might have to suffer a loss of some friends. You might have to suffer some persecution by words. You might have to go witnessing to people with your, with your ears a little red because you're not comfortable with it. It means you might have to uh, give up some television and go spend some time in prayer. It, it, it's suffering in a different way. But listen, Paul said, I am trying to make up the lost time for the suffering that is there that I've lost, and I want to do that. And I'm suffering for you. Verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Look, sometimes we'll suffer for ourselves, but to suffer for somebody else. Paul talked often about how uh, when I suffer, we are, we are dying, he said in 2 Corinthians 4, but you live. Hey, I might be martyred, but you know what? In the process, I'm starting this church. I got put in jail because I came back to town and preached the gospel to you, and I, and I encourage you and strengthen you. But you know what? I'm suffering for you. And by the way, be willing to pay the price for people. It means prayer sometimes. You're fasting sometimes for somebody else. You're praying for them. You're weeping for them. You're fasting for them. You are suffering for somebody else. Get out of the American mindset that the world revolves around you. And if it doesn't have to do with your personal happiness, why are we talking about it? You know, a lot of life is about sacrifice. Sometimes somebody sacrifices for the country. Sometimes somebody sacrifices for the children. But look, nowadays, it's always historically been understood by all mankind that you're going to have to sacrifice for your kids. Even that's going now. Now kids are a toy, and how can my kids make me happy? And you know what? Those kids aren't making me happy, and I want those kids to do this. And now, you know what? Just give them my entertainment center of the room so I don't have to deal with them. Because people aren't willing to sacrifice for another person. Hey, you know what Jesus did? He was sacrificed for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Don't let the world revolve around you. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Look not every man in the things of himself, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 24, the concepts of that verse are so foreign to the American mindset and the American Christian mindset because the world is so much in the church that they're just thinking it's about me. People come to church and say, bless me. Who will make me happy? Who's going to encourage me? I hope the pastor makes a sermon I like. Not even thinking, I wonder if the person next to me is doing okay. Who can I be a blessing to? Who needs my help? Who can I pray for? Let me find someone who looks like they're hurting a church. Let me see if I can help them. Let me, 
look on others. That was Paul's mindset. And to fill up the suffering, the suffering. I feel constantly like the suffering I've had to do for God is so small. I have so few opportunities to suffer for God. One of the funniest things in the world to me is whenever I go on a mission trip, is always they talk about our church and us. And, oh, you guys are willing to do all the hard stuff. You guys are willing to go stay wherever, do whatever work, whatever. I'm going, look, guys, we're going to be here seven, eight, ten days. We'll work hard and we'll be hot and sweaty because everywhere we go is hot and sweaty. And if that's my worst suffering is a suffer when it's 100 degrees and 80% humidity, which is miserable, by the way. But if that's the worst suffering I have, or an uncomfortable motorcycle ride, or sleeping in the bush, that's not much. If someone making fun of me, if you kids in school get made fun of, if you're, your job is, is, is ostracized because you're a real Christian, because you take your Bible to work, because you pray before your meal, look, that's suffering for us. But you know, if that's all the suffering we do, we got to thank God first of all and say, Lord, I'm not earning a lot of treasures here. Because the Bible says you first suffer and you get great treasure in heaven. Paul says, I'm trying to catch up on that. Number, second thing we see here <clears throat> is about a mystery. Verse 25, wherein I am also made a minister. By the way, if you start off with be, catch up on your suffering, the rest of the sermon can only go up from there. And <laughs> because you're all going, catch up on suffering. He's happy. He's getting more suffering. <laughs> and But uh, we're going up from there. Don't worry. And uh, and uh, by my sermon, my sermon will make you suffer a little bit. So I'll catch up. I'll catch you up a little bit. Uh, verse 25, where I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. There's that phrase. First of all, he said, I'm suffering for you. Now he says, God has given me truth to me for you. That is a, a biblical thing. Let me just give, keep your finger there, but I'm going to go back just a little bit to Ephesians. It's a, it's a, I freaked a whole sermon on this phrase, given to me, you word, and uh, Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 2. If ye, uh, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, God goes and says, you know what? Daniel needs something. I was you use you, you Daniel. Should I use you today? Here's Nathan. You want me to use you? Okay, I'll use Travis. So God wants to give something to Travis. And he wants me to be the tool. Why? Because it gives me opportunity to earn treasures. It gives me an opportunity to get my mind off myself. It gives me a chance to serve him and him a chance to serve me and be a blessing to each other instead of every man on his island and just worried about themselves. So God says, Travis needs a dollar. That's right. That's about all you're going to get. And so Travis needs a dollar. You get half of all I have. I know you get all I have. I thought I had two left. No, I'd still do. Whew. And uh, so, you know when you're poor, when you know how many exactly dollars you have in your pocket. and uh, and so Travis needs a dollar. Instead of giving it directly to Travis, where Travis becomes one of these Christians, God, give me, God, give me, and all comes all about him, and he becomes a Christian who's just all about him, he connects us, and Travis doesn't have the dollar. But God gave me the dollar. And so it's given to me for him. And so when I do that, he's too slow. Um... When I do that, and you know you're cheap when a dollar, you know, even get, you know. But when you do that, it makes me die to myself. Oh, and uh, and and so it and it's good for me. And I learn to give because God's a giver. For God's love the world that He gave, and it's good for me. And so God gives you things for other people. If God made you smart, it wasn't for you to glory in your intelligence. If God made you with capabilities or gifts, he didn't do it for you. He gives you things for others. Paul said, God gave me the truth of the gospel to give you. By the way, if you know how to get to heaven, God has given you the dispensation of the gospel to give to others. Don't be one of those hoarding Christians who knows how to go to heaven and doesn't tell anybody. 
What kind of person would be a person who has the cure for something and says, I got it, I'm cured now? They're all talking about the Zika virus right now. What if one person discovered the Zika virus thing, gave himself the treatment, and then said, I got it. I'm so glad I got it. And there's other people who needed it. It's given to me you word. And that's Bible thinking. Oh, let's go back to Colossians there. I'll get my dollar back later. <laughs> I gave it to you, me word. And uh, so, so this, this is a mystery that was given for him to give other people, Colossians chapter 1. And he says, As where am I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to saints. He says, there's a mystery that people don't know. It's been given to me to reveal it. What is that mystery? The next verse tells us what the mystery has been hidden forever. Uh, <clears throat> to whom the God would made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And from the Old Testament times, God had a great mystery hidden, and it was going to be God would live inside of us, Jesus in you. That's what the whole tabernacle was about. The whole temple was about. It was about God dwelling with man, and we would become the temple of God. And a great mystery was hidden. It was all throughout the scriptures, but no one understood it. And now it's been revealed. You get born again, and Christ lives inside of you. And he says, that mystery is revealed to me, so I can give it to you. That's the mystery. And so it's been revealed uh, for that purpose, to give it. And uh, that's what we have. Verse 28, whom we preach more than every man and teach in every man in all wisdom. We represent every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Just notice there the every. Verse 28, in whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Everybody, every human, doesn't matter what their background is, doesn't matter their religion, doesn't matter their age, doesn't matter their color, doesn't matter. Every person deserves a gospel witness. Warning every man. Give them all a chance. I was not, I knocked on the door yesterday and was out witnessing, and, and a guy at the door, and uh, he was uh, mid 20s. And I said, I'm, I'm, for, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm from Open Door, and I want to give an invitation here and invite you to come by. And he says, I'm Muslim. I said, well, that's great. I said, you know, we're out there teaching the most important thing is how to know for sure you're going to heaven. He said, well, my mom's a Christian, I'll give it to her. And I said, well, I'm interested in you. I said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You know, God loves you, and he wants you to go to heaven. Warning every man. I wasn't interested in getting to his mom. That man was there. And that man needed the gospel. Everybody, you don't know who's going to say yes or no, so you give the gospel to everybody. Warning every man and give them a chance. And that's our job. And uh, we've got to get busy at it. And then really, the focus of the message is actually verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. I strive, I labor, I work according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. <clears throat> when you understand Paul in a complete picture of him, it's very fascinating the confidence Paul had. Paul said this, though I have no confidence in the flesh. Paul talked a lot about his physical inabilities. He's weak in bodily presence. There are certain people that you see them, they say, that's a sharp looking guy, that's a big, that's a strong guy. Boy, she looks like she knows what she's doing. You look at Paul and say, oh, that poor guy is kind of weak and kind of feeble. Paul was weak in bodily presence. His speech was contemptible. When he spoke in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, he says, my, my teaching, my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power. He says, I was with you in fear and in trembling and in much weakness. Paul, when he spoke publicly, shook. Paul was not strong bodily. Paul was weak in bodily presence. Paul was probably very small. Paul was, though very bright and very brilliant intellectually, physically he was very weak and very troubled and not imposing and not a great preacher. And, and, and when he spoke, it was, it was caustic, it was contentable, it was contentious. And when he spoke, he was not tactful. 
and he was not great at, at speaking publicly, and maybe he wasn't good at humor, maybe he wasn't good at telling stories, maybe he wasn't good at a whole bunch of things, and he had a bunch of weaknesses, and he was the one who told us about him. See, Paul wasn't the, the modern psychology of standing in front of a mirror and telling yourself a bunch of things about yourself. You are handsome. You're a winner. You are going to do it. That wasn't Paul. Paul didn't try to live. You are tall. Uh, Paul didn't try to do that stuff. You know, Paul said, I'm weak in bodily presence. When I came to you, I shook. I was, I was trembling because, you know, I'm not, I don't like being in front of people. But he said, you found out that it wasn't me. When you felt convicted under that, you knew it wasn't me. You knew it was God. And you weren't saying, I got convinced because that guy was such a good speaker. You knew God did it. And your faith rests in the power of God. And the strange thing is, Paul, who knew all of his weaknesses, and Paul, whose weakness was, Paul, who was put to do what he wasn't good at which God likes to do often. God, God likes to do that. God's got a great sense of humor. Ah, oh, you don't like being in front of people. I got a job for you. And uh, God puts you in weakness because you'll know you can't do it. <clears throat> because you rely on him. Because when you get done and great things happen, you say, that was God, not me. So God puts you in weak positions. He makes a person who's shy be a witness. He makes a person who doesn't want to be in front of people be with people. He makes a person who's introverted go need to go talk to people. He makes a person in their, uh, out of their comfort zone and make them need God and makes them trust and depend on God because when we are good at something and we do it, we take the glory. And so Paul went in, out of his comfort zone into what he wasn't good at, but at the same time, he was very confident. Verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. As you read what Paul wrote, you find out he wasn't going, oh, I can't do it, I can't, I'm not going to do this. He knew wherever he needed to go and whatever he needed to do, he could do. Because he knew God. And he knew God worked in him mightily. He had no doubt that God could use him. <clears throat> He had no, uh, uh, no, no wonder. He knew how God had used him. He saw how God had used him and was confident that wherever he needed to go, whatever he needed to do, whoever he needed to talk to, whatever position he would be in, no matter where he's put, he which had begun a good work will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He had little confidence in himself, but great confidence in his God. I want to say that the whole message is have confidence in God's mighty working. If God has something for you to do, you can do it. If God has something for you to do, he will enable you to do it. A lot of people in the Bible struggle with this, and then God did it. I'm going to go back to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Moses so weak. Moses so insecure. Moses did not think he could do it. <clears throat> Moses was content leading sheep, and God said, go back to Israel. And he said, they won't hear me. Israel won't receive me. Pharaoh won't receive me. Exodus 3, verse 11, Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? <clears throat> and he said, I will certainly be with thee. Moses was looking at himself. God was saying, I will do it. Moses continues in his doubts. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken to my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. He continues on. Verse 10. Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken you know, unto thy servant, but I am slow speech. I am of slow speech and of a slow tongue. Moses was insecure and realize I am not a good speaker. They already rejected me. They're not going to listen to me. <clears throat> he struggled. But God said, hey, don't worry about this. Verse Chapter 4, verse 11, And the Lord spake unto him, said, Who hath made man's mouth? And who maketh the dumb or the deaf and the seen and the blind? Have not I the Lord? God is saying, I made your mouth, Moses. And it'll be good enough. God never said to Moses, no, you're not slow of speech. No, you are eloquent. God did not. God lives in reality, but he can also do miracles. He said, yes, <laughs> yeah, but I made your mouth that way. It's for a purpose. 
and I can do great things through you, and I can do these things. Moses said, I don't have anything that can do this. I don't have the ability. God said, what do you have? He says, I have a rod. That's all I have. God, I don't have an army. I don't have a sword. All I have is a, 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 a staff to take care of sheep with. <clears throat> and verse 2, the Lord said unto Moses, what is that in thine hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast in the ground. And he cast in the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from before. The Lord said to Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. All he had was a slow tongue and a rod, a stick. But God said, that's enough because I'm a mighty God. That rod became mighty. Verse 20, it says, Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Whose rod was it now? God's rod. God had a mighty staff, and that staff parted the Red Sea. That staff made water come out. That staff did miracle after miracle in Egypt. That staff was plenty. Why? Because Moses learned after a while that what God gave me is enough. And God enabled me. God called me to do something. And Moses had insecurities. And Moses knew he wasn't good at things. But he also learned that God could use him because God could work mightily in him just like the same thing that our friend Paul learned. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> See, don't be afraid to do anything for God. Don't be afraid to move. Don't be afraid to obey God's calling or God's leading. And don't be afraid God can't use you. God can work in you mightily. And Paul had the confidence because God worked in him mightily. His confidence wasn't in his ability or his training or his flesh. It was in God. Jeremiah chapter 1, <clears throat> God's talking to Jeremiah. He says, Behold, I formed thee, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet of the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And God said, Lord said, Do not say that. Speak not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I command thee, and whatsoever I command, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. It's an amazing thing. A little child saying, I cannot do it. And God said, don't say that. I and the one who called you, and I will make you able. Don't be insecure. Believe on me. Yes, you're a child, but I'm going to put you over nations. And not only over nations, I'm going to put you over kingdoms, which is a bunch of nations. And you're going to build, and you're going to plant, and you're going to tear it down, you're going to do mighty works. Why? Because my working is going to be in you mightily. <clears throat> David killed Goliath because he wasn't so confident that his sling was the best weapon. Saul tried to give him better weapons, a sword and a shield and a spear and armor and all these things. And he said, no, no, you know what? God is working in me mightily and God already used my sling. And we're going to just take what God's already proven. Because it's going to be God who's going to get his victory, not me. And his sling, though his sling is not the best weapon, his sling was enough to kill Goliath. Because God worked in him mightily. It was a working of God. And God does many things. Our memory verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24, teaches us that God who calls you is going to be the God who does these things. As Philippians says, He that which began a good work will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 24. <clears throat> Faithful is he which calleth you, who will also do it. Faithful is he that calleth you, who will also do it. Do you understand the same person who called is the same person who does it? But in between that is a person called. In between that is God using a person. <clears throat> if I said to somebody here today, I said, Daniel, I want you to go to Fred Meyer. Uh, we need to get, um, uh, we need to go get some batteries, okay? And I said, let me give you some money. Oh, yeah, Travis has it. Uh, let me give you my credit card. And I said, go up there and buy. Let's see, that's my Starbucks card. So I'm going to give you for my birthday. can't have that. Here we go. Take the Lowe's card. Go over to Lowe's, okay? And take that card. And, <clears throat> and I want you to go buy a pack of AA batteries. 
Okay? Now, what if I do this? Daniel, go to, the, go to Lowe's and buy some batteries. Well, I'm calling him to do it for me. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to give him this. Okay? Because that's a church's card. So don't steal it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so I'm going to give him the ability to do what I want done. So when God leads me to do something, it's God wanting it done. So he gives me what I need to get it done. Okay? So God calls me to preach. I'm 16 years, 16, I think. I just turned 16. And there I am. <clears throat> and God calls me to preach. And you understand, I'm introverted. I love being alone. Um, uh, I like, I, if, if I have a choice between people, being alone, I'm alone every time. And the worst thing was, is what happened, happened when I got in front of people. It was bad. When I get in front of people, if you know how, and I, weird thing, I don't get scared of anything else. We, we'd go, I'd go to the river. We'd go jump off railroad bridges into the river. We'd look for giant rapids to go rafting in. We'd go to all, climb all kinds of dumb things. I, I, I wasn't afraid of anything except for one thing. Don't put me in front of a crowd of people. God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to call you to preach. He didn't really say it that way. And, uh, and, and God calls me to the ministry. When I got in front of crowds, it wasn't like I got scared. If, you, if you're like me, you know what I'm talking about. You didn't just get scared. Your body starts panicking. The first time I preached, I couldn't catch my breath. My whole sermon was like this. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. In Philippians, chapter 1. I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm going to pass out. I cannot breathe fast enough. What is wrong with my lungs? And I could feel my heart. My heart was doing this. Kaboom! It was just slow, gigantic beating thing. I thought everybody can see my neck going. Kum, kum. You ever get that nervous? Or you get that scared? And my legs, my knees were weak. My legs are weak. And I, I think God got the wrong phone number when he called me. What am I doing here? And God called me to preach. And they have to be around people. When a pastor, you have to be nice to people. You have to talk to them. All these terrible things. <clears throat> God said, look, if I called you, I'll make it okay. I'll make it so you can get in front of people. And now, put in front of a thousand people, I don't care. Doesn't matter. I'm just as scared in front of a thousand people as I am in front of ten people. Doesn't matter to me. I need God just as much. And I know if anything happens, it's not me. God put me where I'd need to pray so much before I preached. I would need to depend upon God so much. And if anything good happened, it wasn't because I was such a great preacher. It was because God did it. But fortunately, I said yes, so God could prove that he would provide what I needed and equip me to do what needed done. Because when God calls you, he equips you. He who called you will give you what you need. He hands you the card. Now. Here's the thing. <clears throat> if Daniel would have said no to me about going to Lowe's, he wouldn't have got the card. Right? Would Daniel have said, nope, I don't got any money? Well, he doesn't have the money to buy it. But once he agrees to go, then I'll give him the money. And you never get the provision of God, and you never get the blessing of God, and you never get the mighty working of God that works in you mightily like Paul had, that he had great confidence that whatever he had to do, wherever he went, God would give him the ability to help that church, reach that church, help those people, start that church, win those souls, go before the king, whatever he needed to do, it didn't matter, because he, he knew God to work mightily because he always obeyed, and God gives you what you need when you obey. God provides. Don't doubt God's ability to work mightily. <clears throat> How is God able to work mightily in us? First of all, I'm going to go back to Jeremiah chapter 1. How does God do it? The first thing is, He forms you for a job. <clears throat> he forms you for a job. Moses was formed for a job. Jeremiah chapter 1, again. Now, I want to go very carefully into this because a lot of people think they're accidents. 
and you were you, you're just weird and quirky and and different and, and all messed up and 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 you're misfit and your parents might have told you an accident your parents maybe shouldn't have been together all those different things <clears throat> but what I want to say that we have a sovereign God that knows what's going to happen Jeremiah chapter one <clears throat> notice the phrasing God uses verse five before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and notice the way God says that. He didn't say, when I formed you in the belly, I knew you. He said, before I formed you. Every word here is amazing. God said, first of all, just notice, God formed him. God formed him. Notice, it didn't say when you were created or when you appeared or when you mutated or when you, or when you, you, you God said, formed. You know what foreign means, right? Foreign means you take something, you shape it into something. I'm going to make a form of something. God said, I formed you. I made you exactly like this. I formed you. It wasn't, oh, boom, look how you turned out. Huh. No. God formed. God took you and I and he looked, he looked forward with his sovereignty and he looked at you and he looked in his sovereignty and he looked ahead and he saw, I have a job up there. I need someone to do this. And then this person's about to be conceived. Let me form them. Yep, just like this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and God tinkered around and formed you exactly like you are. He did that before you were in the womb. That's an amazing thing. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet of the nations. God said, you were made before I even formed you in the womb. By the way, God forms them in the womb. If you kill that which is in the womb, you just kill something God formed for a job. Okay, it's a, it's, it's a life. It's a formed life for a purpose. For a plan, okay? It's murder. And so he forms them for a purpose. And he formed Jeremiah. He said, I ordained you and formed you. I finished the process. I formed you to be a prophet to the nations. And I ordained you. And I sanctified you. I knew. And Romans 8 says this, whom I did foreknow, I did predestinate. And then and, and justified and he glorified. God sees the whole process. And he says, see what you're going to do. And I'm forming you for a job. <clears throat> Even before you're conceived. You say, well, that's for Jeremiah. Jeremiah was this, this godly man who's supposed to do these things. But what, what about me? My parents weren't even supposed to be together. How can God be involved in that? Look, I am the same thing. My mom got married, married the wrong guy. The guy ran off with the secretary. And after she had three kids with him, and then he ran off and she got divorced. And then she found a guy who was very funny. Had a great personality, but had a drinking problem. It wasn't a good guy. Got together with him. That was, that was my dad. She should never have met my dad. She should have been married to her first husband. And that's just, that should have been what should have happened forever. If she was wise and everybody else and her, her mom and dad never said, that guy's trouble. Stay with me. You shouldn't be with that guy. He's a heavy drinker. He's got problems. And by the way, didn't even last a year. A couple of years for his disaster and war, and, and by the time I was four, he was gone. I wasn't supposed to be. But there was God. And said, well, they're going to conceive a child. And you know, I need a preacher up in Seattle area. Let me form him. <clears throat> You've got to be weird to relate to those people. Make him like this, and let me make him kind of like this, and he's gonna go on a bunch of mission strips. I'm gonna make this make his health like this, I'm gonna make him really handsome, and 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 I gotta and uh da 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 and I gotta form into 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 all these things and and he made me like I was, knowing I'd be here preaching this message today. He has the ability, God, when men mess everything up. When Joseph is, is mistreated by his brothers and they're trying to murder him, God says, I'm going to use this for good. See, God knew you might not have come from the perfect situation, but God said, let me form you anyway for a job. 
The first way he does it, he makes us a certain way. Psalm 139. <clears throat> Psalm 139. Killing me, laughing about me being handsome. Now I don't know if God can use me. And uh, Psalm 139. Verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, and thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knows right well. He's just saying, you know what? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. By the way, this is David. He's saying, well, David's parents are good people. David said in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. We don't know the story, but that's what it says in Psalm 51. Okay? <clears throat> verse 16, nine, or verse 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect. I'm not formed yet even. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. I was formed when there was yet none of them. If you just read all God just said there, God, David here says, <clears throat> before I was conceived, before I was even formed, God had all my members written in the book. Before I was ever fashioned. Isn't that interesting? So God looked forward, saw a need, said, I'm going to form up here that person. Let me write down everything I'm going to have. I'm going to have this guy five foot eight. I'm going to have him 130 pounds. And I'm going to have uh, this guy look like this. I'm going to have this lady look like this. I'm going to have this guy this. I'm going to make the eyes this color. I'm going to make her have this. I'm going to make this guy. He's going to talk like this. He's going to have this sense of humor. He's going to be uh, left brain. He's going to be right brain. He's going to be kind of quirky in this way. And God wrote down your members before you were ever conceived. And then God makes a DNA work like it does. And boom. And by the way, <laughs> Look, I have seven kids. My kids are so different. They got the same DNA from me and my wife. But can I tell you, my kids are completely different. Really different. If you don't know my kids are different, you'll be like, oh, your kids are all the same. And nobody ever says that to me. My kids are way too different, number one. But just knowing my kids. I have kids who talk all the time, kids who won't say a word, kids who are super good at this and not good at this. And kids are, why? Because God forms them. And yes, he, he puts the characteristics in the parents and he works it all out and he makes a plan and knows who will meet and does whatever. But you know, that little baby in there and that little baby in there, it's already planned. It's already got an ordination of God for a job. And understand this, if God has kids for you to raise, God will enable you. If God has a ministry for you to do, God will enable you. If God's, look, you're not sitting there in this random chaos hoping for the best thing to happen. If God wants you to do something, you do it. You say, but I, I'm not very good at that. Trust his enabling. First of all, he formed you for a job. He formed you for something to do. Secondly, after he forms you, he enables you. First Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, he enables you. And again, there's a lot of verses we're using it all, all say the same thing, but we're using different ones. First Timothy 1.12 <clears throat> says this. I think, First Timothy 1.12, and I think uh, Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Colossians 1.11, uh, we were there, I should have kept there. But God, he says there, God enabled me. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 <clears throat> In verse 11, says this, Strengtheneth all might according to his glorious power with all patience and to all long suffering. It's strengthened with his might, with his ability, that he gives us these, these, these abilities to do that. And so we realize these things. Why? God enables you to do something. So God looks forward, he forms you for a job, but then you're going to need his empowering. Because even if you have the ability to do it, if I was a great public speaker and naturally gifted in front of people and all those things, if I got up here and tried to preach the Bible to you, it would still not get done. 
I could give you a message, but your life could not be changed. The Holy Spirit could not work in your heart. You're, you cannot understand the scriptures. Your life could not be transformed. You cannot be convicted or whatever God jo- jo- go- uh, job God had to do. Understanding comes by the Spirit. Natural man understandeth not the things of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes the enabling of God. If I go to win a soul, I can have the plan of salvation memorized perfectly. But if I don't have the Lord speaking to their hearts, they can't be converted. You can give all the lectures you want, but understand, without the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to change a life. It's not going to do what needs done. You've got to have God's power to do God's work. And the first thing is he forms you for a job, but then you need to get his enabling. The disciples said, hey, what are we supposed to do? And he says, "Uh, go preach the gospel to every creature. But he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto you. He gives you his power, Colossians 1.11, according to his mighty working. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He enables you by giving you his power to do it. The Holy Spirit moving, the Holy Spirit speaking through you, the Holy Spirit stirring you, the Holy Spirit giving him power behind your words where people are under conviction where God speaks and changes life, where they're discouraged and they get encouraged by your words, where you have just the right words, where you come up with an illustration you didn't think of before, where God is enabling you to do his work. Someone's weeping and brokenhearted, and you don't know what to do to comfort them, and you say, Lord, help me to help them. I don't know what to do. And God says, perfect. I made you do this job. And you go there, and all of a sudden, you don't know what to say, but all of a sudden, this verse comes to your mind. He said, let me read you some verses out of 1 Peter 5. And you're thinking, what's in 1 Peter 5? And you go out there, and you read, I hope there's a 1 Peter 5. And then you read them to him, and those verses are about casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And, and all of a sudden, you say, you know, I want you to know, God told me to tell you that, you know, he still loves you. And they begin to weep and say, I've been wondering if God still loves me. See, God enabled you. God helped you. God gave you the wisdom. It's his enabling, first of all, with his power, where he is speaking through you with, where he puts a, he puts a force behind what you say. He puts a, a power in your labor, and you get enabled by God, and you trust God to be able to do that. Look, if you quit looking at yourself and say, I can't, I can't, look about me, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at this, then be like Paul and say, I can do it according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. You, really, you can let God use you instead of always worrying about your own failures. Second thing he does is he gives gifts. I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. It's right near here. He enables you and then he gives gifts. All this is saying that God will give you the ability to do what you need to do. God will trust. You need to trust God's mighty working in you that he can use you. Ephesians chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse 7 and 8, it says, but Unto every one of us is given grace according to the the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. By the way, you know the foolishness of the, per- of the person who thinks they don't need to go to church and thinks they can just go to church at home? They think they have every single spiritual gift. They're just the encapsulation of every gift God has ever given. Because God says, I give all these different gifts. And he has three different lists of gifts that are all different. And I do those for the perfecting of the saints. And this person puts this in, and this person puts this in, and this person does this. And the church becomes, as it says here, until, uh, until we all, verse 13, until we all come to the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the, of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. It says, you know what? A complete church with all the gifts becomes mature. And we all become the measure, the fullness of Christ. Be like Jesus, and that's what we're supposed to be. And to become that, why? Because God enables. God gives gifts. I don't have certain gifts. I know I don't. There are certain things I'm not good at. I can list them to you. I probably don't need to. So the things I'm very gifted at and come very easily and very naturally to me, and God just, when I do those things, it just works somehow. That, That is... Not only does God enable, but sometimes God just gives you an ability. 
One person has the ability to encourage people. Another person has the ability to make money and give. Another person has the ability to teach. Another person has the ability to do whatever. Look, we all have gifts given to help. And, and, and look, if God called me to preach, which he did, and I was not planning on it. It's not what I want to do. It's not what I suspected. It's not what I knew was coming. It was one night in a park at, at midnight. God said, be a preacher. Then God is going to give me, if he wants me a pastor, which is a, which is a specific gift, and this we just read, he says a pastor and teacher. Then it says in 1 Timothy 3, it says, he that is uh, going to be a, a pastor he needs to be apt to teach. He has to be able to teach. If you're, if you're a pastor, you have to be able to teach the Bible. And so if I'm going to come in, and my main job in the Bible is to feed the flock of God, God is going to give me a gift to teach the Bible. And understand that not everybody can do that. Not if, How many people in school, you remember the teacher who couldn't teach? But they were a teacher, they had a position, but didn't know how to teach? Boy, I had teachers like that. And they, they tried. They had the same education, but they couldn't teach. But if God is going to call me to this job, he's going to give me the gift of a pastor teacher. So I can teach and you'll say, oh, I understand. Wow, I didn't see that before. That, that's the, yep, that's there. That's what God has to do. He's got to gift me for a job. And I believe whom God calls, God equips according to his mighty work. And if he says, I'm going to give you a job, I'm going to give you the Lowe's card. So you don't need to be sitting there saying, I can't, I'm not good, I can't do that. Well, you say, you know what? I know I can't do this, but if God's called me to do it, he'll give me the ability. When Jeremiah said, I can't, God said, don't say that. I, I, I formed you to do this. Jeremiah, I formed you in the womb for this job. Moses, I formed your mouth. You can go speak to them. I formed you. I formed you, Jeremiah. I formed you, Paul. I formed you, David. I formed you. I made you for a job. And I'll give you my power. And I'll give you the gifts you need. I am the one who works in you mightily. So Paul said, hey, I can come there and do what needs done according to his power. It works me mightily. So why did God? Why does God ask me to do things that are hard for me? Because you won't trust yourself and you'll rely on Him. Because He'll make put you in a position where you got to say, "Lord, I can't do this." Sometimes God lets you fail. And you say, "I I did I I, I did my best. I didn't what I, I tried." God says, yeah, you can't do this. I let you fail because you kept on relying. You thought you are so hot. You thought you knew. You thought you had it. You need me. John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. And you get to be reliant and dependent upon God. And you get to the point, and you know, you just start saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I have an idea, I have a plan, I've gotten some advice, I've read, I've studied, and I'm going to try to do this. And Lord, I think this is the best way, but Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to guide me. I don't know, I don't know if it'll work. I know my best ability won't do it. And like, I just want to tell you, if I get up here and I can, by the way, I can make a lot prettier sermons than I make. We've talked about this lately. I can make a sermon, you would think, wow, that was eloquent. That, that had everything rhymed, everything. You had a good poem there. There was tear-jerking illustrations, and you had everything had the right letters and started, and and and, 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 and I could work on all that stuff. You know, it's still not going to change your life. A good sermon doesn't change your life. The power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God does. And God lets us be weak, and he puts us where we're a little uncomfortable, and he makes you do something you don't really think you're good at many times because you rely on him for that. And then he gives you gifts, and then you realize that gift is given of God. And you can only do it because God gave you the gift. And in the end, God gives you the glory. Let's go back to our original verse, Colossians 1. All this is to say, don't doubt his mighty work in you. Don't doubt God's ability to prepare you. You say, it's all about me. It's not all about you. It's doubting God. It's doubting God can use you. Colossians chapter 1. He's talking about soul winning, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Wouldn't you like to have the confidence that God is using you in a great way? 
That's there for you. It is there for you to say, God is using me in a great way. But it's going to be where he gets the glory. Not, I am such a good talker. I won that person to Christ. If you won the Christ, they ain't saved. Well, I, I'm, I'm so good at this stuff. I, you know what? I just know I'll raise great kids because I just love kids. Might find a little harder than that in this culture. You might find you need God. But then when you find after a while, <laughs> here's the funniest thing in the world, is after a while, <clears throat> once you've learned God can use you, now God has shown you that. Now God has given you the confidence in him. He can send you anywhere to do anything. And then somebody throws something at you to do. And God says, here, God, I've given this to do. And you say, I have no idea how to do that. But you know what? God will figure it out. And pretty soon, you know, no, I can't. No, no, no. You don't live that way. You say, fine, okay. Because you have confidence in God. If God's given you a job, if God's given you something to do, he can enable you to do it. And you begin to look up instead of inward. And you begin to trust God instead of yourself. And you realize God can use you to, to do anything. And let me tell you, when you realize that you need him for everything, anything's possible. That's why the same guy who wrote this in Colossians 1 said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What needs done? It'll be fine. I'll get it. I'll get, I, I, can, I, can, I can be based abound. It doesn't matter. I can, I can be suffer full, suffer need. It doesn't matter. Whatever happens, I'll be fine because I've learned that my God can do anything. And if he gives me something to do, I can do it. So you know what? You have some things you need to get done, some important things, some influence, some, some works, some ministry, some helping people, some influence in family, whatever it is. Look, you, you probably can't. I can't do it. You probably can't. <clears throat> but you got a God who formed you for it. And you got a God who can give you the gifts to do it. And you have a God who can empower you to do it. And so go forth boldly, like Paul did. Not confidence in the flesh. Paul said, I have no confidence in the flesh. But go confident saying, he works mightily in me. He prepared me for this, so I, I, must, I must have what I need to do it. He must have given me the card if he's given me the job. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we'd be bold in you to go forth. And Lord, we, we, have, we, need, we need bold Christians today who can do mighty works, who aren't trembling in fear, thinking that great things can't be done. We need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, Christians, Lord. Lord, it's not getting done. The, 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 the souls that are fallen aren't getting lifted. The needy aren't getting helped. The weeping aren't getting comforted. The lost aren't getting saved because we have Christians who are looking at themselves too much. <clears throat> I pray today we'd learn that you who called us, faithful is he who called us who will also do it. Lord, that's our verse this week. And realize you're faithful. And you can help us. 